So at about 7,000 feet on the west slopes of uh, Mount Shasta, including the uh, Shastina Cindercon, the actual active part of the mountain, it still has the potential to be volcanic. Uh, we're going up, look at this nice uh, Carsalopus Semperverix, remember the, uh, the oak family related to chestnuts. Got a nice little edible nut inside that burr. Uh, we're looking for a somewhat rare, actually very rare, diminutive fern that uh, grows in pure pumice rock. It was only discovered growing on this mountain in 2009. Oh shit, the fucking altitude in the slopes already getting to me. The uh, nearest population of it is up at Crater Lake, Oregon. And you can actually see it. You can drive right up to the spot where it grows, but they wouldn't be that fun. Plus all the obnoxious tourists and geriatrics and RVs and shit might spoil the fun a little bit so where we're gonna go is way up there uh, but it looks like they got some snow a couple days ago uh, which might make uh, might hamper efforts to hike up there as well as uh, efforts to see uh, this fern since it only tops out at about three inches tall so right there just barely beneath the cloud layer you have uh, the black butte cinder cone which tops out at about 6600 feet it's a nice spot they got a nice trail up there there used to be a little uh there was a fire lookout and what the shit, I think it burned down. And there's a healthy population of Northern Pacific rattlesnakes that have a peculiarly distinct green tinge to them. And you see them a lot, and obviously not now because it's kind of cold. But you'll see them in there in the summer, you know, if you hike that shit in July or something. And as you get to the top, the white bark pines start appearing and appearing and stuff. You got a relatively interesting uh, floral community. But, uh, you know, like I said, it's just, it's a series, it's not actually one, just one cinder cone, it's a composite cinder cone. So it's a series of uh, basically areas where molten magma, relatively viscous molten magma, as you can tell from the steep slopes of it. Remember, viscous uh, molten magma is the high silica magma that doesn't flow. It's not all runny like the shit, like the pohoho. Someone told me that's actually pronounced pohoyoy, but I'm going to keep calling it pohoho in, a, in, in Hawaii. You know, that's basaltic magma, low silica flows real nice and easy the shit you see around here this is all the andesite it's more intermediate it's got a little bit more silica in it and because of that it doesn't flow too well so when it's coming out the ground in the domes and the cinder cones and shit it plugs up and uh it tends to uh all the gas that's in there gets trapped because this stuff doesn't flow too well it's like thick tar and so as a result the gases uh accumulate beneath it and you end up having a very explosive volcano a la mount st helens uh, mount lassen or mount shasta up there so the, the dominant plant life here, this guy's Arctostaphylos patula, relative of blueberries, Ericaceae, manzanita, is the genus Arctostaphylos, bearberries, uh, but, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, you do see, you see, a, you actually do see a good quality of these berries in the bear shit when you see a nice pile, you know, especially a freshly laid one that might even still be steaming. But uh, the bears generally don't want to have anything to do with you as long as the food source is, is abundant and they normally tend to run, you know. And uh, knowing my uh, my dumbass, I would likely run towards them to try and get some photographs, but they uh, they tend to run. Those uh, trees over there were right at the transition between white fir, Abies concolor, and then as you get higher up, you get the red fir, which is uh, shorter, uh, more vertically oriented blue needles and uh, reddish bark. That's the name, red fir. Red fir normally only, you only get above uh, altitudes of 6,000 feet, and it's pretty abundant. Of course, the cones on these sit upright on the branches instead of being pendant and hanging down like uh, their close relatives the pines and they are in the pine family panaceae there you got a species of ericamaria not blooming yet a lot of diversity in this genus sunflower family let's see if we can get one that's flowering nice yeah there you go over here holy shit look at a beautiful shasta valley isn't it nice where do you get the, the mounds the shasta mounds Remnants of an ancient pyroclastic flow. You know, anyway, here's that Eric Camaria. It's got ligules. Ligules with maybe four or five floors per capitula. I don't know. See the filaries on it too. Very elongated capitulas. Elongated flower heads. So there you go. That glow shit on the sides of these red furs right here is called wolf lichen. It reportedly, uh, the lore goes that it was at one point used uh, to poison wolves, which, uh, 
I guess I could believe that. I don't know what the, how toxic it is or what compounds might be uh, contained within its tissues that would make it toxic to wolves, you know. But uh, the shit. Either way, it's it's uh, pretty beautiful, you know. And it thrives at these higher elevation coniferous forests. It's just a fucking weird looking thing. And again, it's the symbiosis symbiosis between a fungus and an algae. And maybe sometimes they're having a threesome. You know, maybe sometimes there's a yeast in there too. You know? You filamentous bastard. What a glorious filamentous bastard. Look at it. Then when it gets fruiting bodies, I believe they look like little cups. If I could see any. But you can see it's doing very well. And of course all the lichens need relatively clean air. Uh, to do their thing. That's why you never really see too many in cities. There you go. So we'll give this rock a nice rectal exam. You can see it's got what are called phenocrysts in it. So it's uh, an andesitic rock. It's an andesitic magma. That is, it's uh, intermediate in silica composition. Not too much, not too little. And uh, then those little black phenocrysts, those are called phenocrysts. When you get basically a, uh, well, first off, you have the grain size of the rock, right? Which if you get up close, you can see there's tiny little shimmery crystals in there in the white uh, the white matrix and then those huge black uh, bodies those are what are called phenocrysts phenol and they're basically you know mineral grains that occur larger mineral grains that occur within a matrix of more finely grained uh, material and this is a, it looks like it might be hornblende or something but you know I'm not really good at a lot of my mineral identifications because uh, it doesn't uh, doesn't relate to the plants that much I, I like the shiny shit to a little a, a little extent but I'm not the uh, I'm not a super, uh, you know, super ripe on my, my goddamn uh, the mineral ID. But regardless, that's what a phenocryst is. So now you know what the fuck a phenocryst is. And uh, again, it's andesitic magma. magma. It goes rhyolite on the more silica-rich end of the spectrum. Then it goes andesite, intermediate. And then the uh, lower density, or lower uh, silica composition rocks, basalt, uh, on the, the other end of the spectrum. So... Uh, and those are all extrusive igneous rocks. They're basically all just uh, liquid that cools on the surface of the earth as opposed to deep inside it. You know, and it cools very fast. The extrusive igneous rocks cool very fast compared to the much slower cooling intrusive igneous rocks like the granites and the diorites and what the shit. Go there. See, there's the Abies Magnifica, the red fur. See how they're, they're sh relatively short needles and they're pointing almost vertically up? So it's, it's a combination of that. But you can't go by the needles alone, because sometimes the needles can look like white fur, especially when they're young, like this. See how these needles don't point vertically up, they're more white, uh, wide, you know, and, and horizontal. So it's a combination of the way the needles look, they're bluer, they're vertically oriented, and then of course, once they get larger, the bark is red. And the the elevation we're at too, you don't really get the, you don't get white furs, Abies concolor, up this high, it's mostly red fur. And then of course, Look at that crown. Just the geometry of those branches and what the shit, like almost dichotomous branching. Okay, so now we're starting to go up. The GPS is, well, I'm telling us after looking at the map that uh, basically what we're going to do is get up on top of the spine up there and then follow the spine all the way up to an area where I know that this uh, botrychium has been collected before. So this is a super rare plant, like I said. When it was collected, there were only six plants identified. And again, it only gets about yay high, tends to grow beneath rocks, and is very inconspicuous and spends the first stage of its life completely underground, not even photosynthesizing, just in a mycorrhizal that is symbiotic relationship uh, with fungi in the ground. Which, uh, of course, if you know anything about mycorrhizae, uh, almost everything in the pine family is mycorrhizal. Here's a nice, uh, speaking of fungi in the ground, here's a member of the blueberry family that uh, is entirely parasitic on fungi in the ground. It's parasitic on fungi that are mycorrhizal with uh, these furs right here. This is Pterospora andromeda, and it's a rather uh, ripe and healthy looking one. Those are the fruits on it. It's already done blooming. Beautiful color in there. And you could see the glandular, just the, look at the glands on those. It's almost sticky. So this is what you would call a mycoheterotroph. Heterotrophic versus autotrophic. 
autotrophic, meaning it produces its own food, like most plants and cyanobacteria, and uh, heterotrophic, meaning it relies on another organism for food, which this does. It relies on fungi for food. It basically steals from fungi, so thus you get the word mycoheterotrophic. And it wasn't even really known to be a phenomenon until recently, the last 20 years. You know, prior to that, people thought that they called these saprotrophs, which is very wrong and misleading. You know, presuming that they're basically feeding like a fungus on, on dead stuff. Oh, hi, Rio. And uh, anyway, wonderful plant. Not at all uncommon. You get some of these in Wisconsin, supposedly. There's the fruits, little capsule. And it basically just, uh, you know, where they dry out and crack open and the seed is just tiny. It disperses all throughout the forest to shit. And then, you know, it starts doing its own thing again. Little stock. You can see some rudimentary leaves right there. But again, this plant produces no chlorophyll at all. It's completely achlorophyllous, completely dependent on fungi in the ground. Look at the bricks. You like the bricks? You like bricks? Do you like bricks? Huh? Go Anyway, so there's one of these fruits off this pterospora. Cracked that bastard open and opened it up, and here's the little seeds. You can see it's just a, looks like a little grain. It's basically like a winged, a little winged bastard, you know? And it does, again, it doesn't need to have much material there. It doesn't need an endosperm. It doesn't need that mealy starch that a lot of seeds have, you know, say an acorn, because it's not, uh, it doesn't photosynthesize anyway. It's the, completely dependent on the fungi in the ground. So the, ideally, I guess this thing lands somewhere. On a patch of bare soil, or at least where the, the duff has been scraped away enough, and he, uh, you know, whatever mycorrhizal fungi are down there, I don't even know what's what speed, what genera that would be. It's more uh, my friend Allen's field. Oh, there's another one over there, and uh, basically, uh, you know, it gets going, starts uh, it starts growing on the on the fungi, you know, which is a similar thing to what orchids do, except orchids are not uh, parasitizing the fungi. Some do, but uh, but. Most don't, you know, but they still need fungi. Their seeds are very tiny, you know, and dust-like and, and uh, need uh, mycorrhizal fungi uh, to germinate and start growing successfully. So. But there you go. There's a, there's a cone on that Abies Magnifica. You can see they point upright on the branches. There's another genus that does this, the genus Cedrus, which is not native to the Americas at all. Uh, Cedrus Atlantica, Cedrus Libanii. Etc. You know, the famous cedars of Lebanon that uh, reportedly don't grow in Lebanon anymore uh, because, uh, you know, the, the human race has basically annihilated them from their natural habitat, as we're so good at doing. Uh, you can see this cone, unlike a pine cone, it's only got basically a central stem in there. And all those little bracts just dehiss, and uh, basically the cone disintegrates. Each one of those bracts, looking like little roofing shingles, uh, points inward to the central the central stem and then they just basically the little wing it's basically each brick is basically a little winged seed that then just disperses and falls wherever the shit this can be a really weedy tree it's a native tree but it could be real weedy you know and that's why one of the reasons why wildfire used to be so good because basically the, you know you get a lot of white furs growing you get too many of them they're out competing all the other shit and then but they're not fired that that at all they got a relatively thin bark Fire comes through, kills all the seedlings, you know, only spares a couple, and uh, then everything else in the forest is able to compete with them, and the, the diversity is maintained. Anyway, that's that's a uh, red fir, Abies magnifica. You like that climate? Perfect 60 degrees, maybe a little chillier, maybe even 50. Oh, yeah, so we're just following the spine up. Basically an old, I don't know if this is a pyroclastic, no, it wouldn't be a pyroclastic flow, it would just be where the magma cooled one of the magma runners this is a little bit darker though I wonder if this is still andesite I guess could be more rhyolitic could even be a little bit mafic with some iron in it you know there's some nice some nice uh, ratios of iron to the silica low, lower silica oh shit certainly break your ass terrain though And then of course where we want to be is the point where the forest tapers off and the trees basically become small windblown shrubs. And it's where our target plant is going to be. Yeah, you'll be, to be honest with you, I don't think we're going to find it. I think it's going to be far too uh, buried in snow. And I do not like hiking in snow. Here's one of those little, 
shelf fung at it to get on the first. Oh yeah, that's that's gonna suck going up there. It's not gonna be too nice. Oh yeah, here we go. No snow though. No snow yet. Not too bad. It could be worse. Could always be worse, you know. If there's one thing life has taught me, it can always be worse. Oh look at that, just the bounty of chinkapins. Chrysalopus sempervirens, you know? Unlike it's uh, uh, the other sister species out here on the West Coast, Coast Chrysalopus chrysophila, this one tops out at like eight feet at the most, and even that is rare. Most of the time you don't see it above your waist. But, uh, you know, here's Arctostaphylus nevidensis, basically a prostrate growing manzanita. You know, and it doesn't need to get tall because it grows at such high altitudes that uh, nothing's normally, uh, you know, shading over it. And even if stuff does shade over it, it's fine. But you can see here, it's just kind of flowing with the rocks. Oh, what's that? That looks like a white bark pine. Pinus albicollis. Seed is dispersed by Clark's nutcracker. Species of bird. You can make pesto out of that, which I've done before. Oh, it's a little steep. Boy, I'm, so, I'm glad I started doing squats a couple months ago. You know, there's no way to really... It's good for your ass, you know? Helps you get a nice, nice rotund ass. You know, who doesn't like that? Jack, you like that, huh? Your ass is pretty rotund. You're not doing too bad. You're kind of good, Jack. Looking kind of healthy. All right, there we go. Oh, yeah, see, it opens up. The tree line tapers off. You see that up there? That's up where we're going. Shouldn't be too nice getting up there, but it'll be nice once. Okay, so here's that Arctostaphylus nevidensis, and it's got berries on it. You can see why they call this genus Manzanita. They look like little apples. And I thought they would, you know, taste like shit, <clears throat> but still put one in my mouth anyway. Just as kind of a whim. And they're actually kind of sweet. They're very astringent, but they're actually kind of sweet. You know, there's not much uh, actual fruit on them. The, the mesocarp, it's mostly just the, uh, the stone seed inside. But right now they're at their prime. They eventually end up drying out and just being kind of mealy and gross. But these actually have a little bit of flavor and there's a little bit of sugar in there too. Gotta spit those seeds out the dock. You know, here's another edible plant. Don't really give a shit about what's edible or not. I'm interested in the ecology and the evolutionary lineages. But uh, this plant is the native current in the genus Ribes. And uh, the genus Ribes, unfortunately, is actually one of the two hosts to an invasive fungus, an invasive pathogen that takes out a lot of the five-needled pines, like that, uh, that white bark pine that I just showed you. It's called white pine blister rust, and it was brought in to the country on uh, pine trees that I believe were grown in Germany. So the fungus is native to Germany, but, uh, you know, it's pretty much established here, and it kills a lot of trees out here now. And it's basically just a matter of uh, of seeing, you know, what, uh, you know, pre-existing genetic resistance there is in the populations of the five-needled pines that it attacks. Little, look, there's a little squirrel going to town on one of those Abies cones. You know, it's a little cafe. It must not taste it too good, though, because he didn't finish it. Oh, that's not too bad. So now, instead of walking through the thick brush, uh, you know, and tripping over branches and shit over a ground level we can't really see. Now we're walking on unstable boulders uh, on the side of this canyon, you know? It's kind of nice. Almost at the cloud line, you know? It's not too bad. It's really not too bad. It's not too nice either, I'm not going to lie. It's not too nice, but it's not too bad. It could be worse, you know? You get good boots, it'd be okay, you know, as long as you're not wearing thongs. You ever wear thongs going through a boulder field? Huh? Do you ever wear some flip flops? Some nice Dollar General flip flops going through a. No, man, later. There we go, just up there. Just a, a mile as the crow flies, but about a, I don't know, 1100 foot elevation game. Well, that juicy bastard right there, that's a wild ginger. Another uh, evidence of the. Uh, Another piece of evidence uh, against the use of common names is it has no relation to ginger whatsoever. It's not even a monocot. It's actually, I believe it's in the Aristolochiaceae, one of the ba basal uh, angiosperm lineage, lineages, one of the more ancient lineages of flowering plants. And over here, a wonderful member of this boulder pile, uh, I believe we might have a Ligustacum grayi, certainly an Apiaceae, a member of the carrot family for sure. No way to tell. Uh, well, at least not for me because I'm not the... Uh, 
utterly familiar with most members of this family. But, you know, if it is like goose to come, normally the smell will give it away. So let's see if... Yeah, I can't tell. It kind of smells like celery. But a ligustacum, of course, is a genus. A lot of herbalists like that because I think they, I say if you'd make a tincture or a potion out of it, uh, it helps with the asthma or something like that. Or you put it in your ass, I don't know. It does smell pretty good, I'm not going to lie. I like the osha. But, it, uh, you know, it gets over harvested too. A lot of people. It grows a ligustacum porteri, which you get in the Rocky Mountains, grows over, oh, at about elevations above 10,000 feet. And uh, it does, it gets over harvested. I met some uh, ranger, park ranger once who told me he found a Mormon family with about, I don't know, 200 pounds of roots in their truck. Uh, needless to say, they were uh, they received the citation and all their shit was uh, confiscated. So here's some kind of parasite. I can't tell if it's a mycoheterotroph, that is a parasite on fungi, or if it's a uh, parasitic on another plant. Is it's a uh, long past flowering, dried out. You know, but it was coming out the ground right here. So I'll just collect it. We'll take it back and try to figure out what the shit it is. Only a little bit farther to go. Famous last words. The old boy collected a cyclodenia, a member of the uh, Pasanaceae. See the little follicle? All the members of a Pasanaceae have a fruit called a follicle, meaning it just splits open at one seam. Anyway, that's a, that's a member of the milkweed family that uh, enjoys growing in the more pumice, you know, exposed rocky areas. So... It's nice. It's just uh, just about finishing up for the season, going back to its perennial rhizome. Very succulent. So there's that uh, Cyclodenia apostanaceae. See, it's still going strong. It's not too bad. I don't see any follicles on these, though. Maybe a couple. I've seen this coming out of mountains that are just composed of pure pumice rock. Really likes the volcanic palace. Holy shit. Still got quite a ways to go. Look at your little buckwheat, it's an ariaganum. No basil, the basil leaves are already gone. This is really fucked up to walk in. This shit is pretty uh, terrible. I'd much prefer to, fuck. I'd much prefer to rubble to the uh, volcanic sand, you know? You take one step forward, it sends you half a step back, you know? But uh, you, you gotta get used to that, you know? It's like. Waiting on Western Avenue for the bus when it's five degrees outside, you know? And like I said, it could always be worse. You know, it could be raining on us, or we could be being chased by a bear right now. Hey, look at a nice pumice rock. Isn't that nice to walk in? Okay, so the plant we're looking for, Botrychium pumicola, is a member of the Ophio glossaceae, a very ancient lineage of ferns. They look fucking weird. I say fern, but you can't think of it like a fern. It doesn't look like some lacy green bullshit. It's got foliage that looks like it's composed of plastic. It's very leathery. And uh, basically, you know, they only get two or three inches tall. I guess they can get up to eight or nine inches. But uh, all the pictures of the ones I've seen on this population uh, only, you know, max out of like two or three feet. And it does, it looks like a little alien hand uh, unfurling from the pumice rock. And it likes to grow at the bases of boulders sitting in the pumice stone so hopefully we'll find it you know it's fucking rare it's extremely rare and it might not even be up anymore or it might be covered in the snow that just fell on this mountain a couple days ago and again it only grows about eight or nine thousand feet i think we're at like 81 right now but if we do find it, it'll be nice but i always got to go up there you know expecting not to it's about the journey not the destination didn't you see that on your high school guidance counselor's uh, office door, you know, when she was telling you how, you know, you're going to be a fuck up and you're not really going to go anywhere? Did you get that treatment? I didn't. Oh, uh, yeah, there we are, right at the cloud line. How about that? As long as it doesn't rain, I think we'll be good. It's still a little early for the rainy season to start. First sign of snow right there. You got to look at my little barometer in a altimeter thing see what exact elevation we're at but we are kind of high and you can certainly feel it too however the, we're getting into more of the alpine zone hopefully it'll be some good stuff up there maybe some Hosea nana maybe even a botrychia and pumacoa
well above black beet right now. And just for reference again, the top of that little cinder cone is 66. So it's 6,600 feet and we're about a thousand and a half feet above that. Aren't you glad you started doing squats, you know? You know? Go do the Brazilian butt workout. You know? Move that ass. Work that ass, you know? I just, honestly, the only reason I do the squats is to make sure my ass looks good in tights, you know? When I'm prancing around and sashaying and shit. Oh, fuck. Yeah, all right, go fuck yourself. I'll get back to you in a minute. Look, it's a silene. Not that. Huh? You think it is. And so this is the type of shit it grows in. It just likes the rocky shit, you know? This is also pica habitat. What are you doing, Jack? You eating snow? Hey, what are you doing? What are you doing, huh? You could do that. That's fine. I'm not, I'm just, I'm, you're not in trouble. I'm just curious. This is pica habitat. And when I've been up here before, uh, you know, you'll hear the little bastards. I think they're, pikas are relatives of rabbits. But, you know, they're, they're another, uh, might be a casualty of climate change. You know, because they can't, uh, they can only go so high up. And they're, of course, adapted to the high elevation alpine environments. But they're, you know, real cute little bastards, real adorable little bastards. Just a little ball of fluff. They come out their little hole, you know, nibble on some shit, make a little spit wad of leaves, then bring them back to their hole and they store all that shit for the, uh, for the winter, you know. I believe they just go dormant in the winter, of course, being that it's so got to be so brutally and impossibly cold here, as well as uh, everything being covered in snow. But, uh, Oh, yeah, and then they pop their heads on and make a little bit sound. And, you know, I don't think we're going to find this thing. I think it's, I think it's going to be uh, buried under snow up there. And then, of course, there's the peak of Shasta up at about uh, 14,000 feet. I think the total height of Shasta is 14,300. I don't know. I've never gone up there. Oh, that's pretty nice. Yeah, that makes me feel pretty good. Feels pretty good to look at it. There you go, there's the Shasta Valley. Little oh, patch of Cyclodenia here. Remember milkweed family of Pasanaceae? Here's a nice uh, member of the mint family. A species of uh, Monarda. No, Monardella. What is it? Monarda, Monarda. I always confuse the two. You get uh, Monarda back east. This is Monardella. But uh, anyway, it does. You see the opposite leaves. Remember the Lamiaceae, the, the Salvia family, Salvia, Mint, Oregano. And it does. It smells pretty nice. Very pungent. You can smell it from here. Nice. So we're in the shadow of a cloud right now. Basically, since we're right at cloud level, the sun is just behind it. So we're basically in line with the sun. We're so goddamn high up. But you can see the habitat. Just these bounding uh, clumps of, there's Arctostaphylos. It's probably a Persia. Uh, the shit else. See some white bark pines in there. And up on top of that little knob is where we have to go. So that's why I'm kind of, uh, <laughs> I'm kind of assuming that we're maybe not going to make it all the way up there. Uh, being that the sun will set on our ass in a, a couple hours. But uh, we'll see how far we could go. You know, the habitat's pretty nice. A little talus and scree. Don't you like volcanic scree, huh? Oh, that's a nice view. See, we're hitting the snow fields. Here's uh, some Abies Magnifica. Is she having a nice time over there? Just enjoying yourself, Jack? Huh? Anticipating the, the can of salchichas I'm going to give you? Anyway, hey, you can see, it's a fucking 20-foot tall tree. It's probably over 100 years old. You know, you got to maximize that growing season here, which lasts about, I don't know, three months probably. Holy shit. Anyway, so, yeah, the, the point that we're following is up on top of that hill. But, you know, there's always the off chance we'll see one down at lower elevations. It's not too bad. Could be okay. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah, nice uh, Canactus douglasii. Remember the uh, sunflower family Asteraceae. Nice perennial. Look at that rosette. No flower this year for this guy. Maybe next year. Huh? And then here's that rock. Very gothic looking rock. It just forms these plates for whatever reason. A little darker than most of the uh, andesite I see. But it makes a nice sound when you step on it.
good. There's all the white bark pines, you know, and, and, and more a uh, amicable environment, maybe a little bit lower. Uh, they'd be uh, full grown trees upwards of 30 to 40 feet tall, but of course, here you get a couple of them popping out. It, it max, you know, eight feet. I mean, that's a that's a big guy. This guy right here, and it's about 15 feet tall. It's probably a 200 year old tree. And then here you have some of the newest rock in California, some of the youngest rock. All products of the uh, eruption of Chastina in seven. God, it's a fucking nightmare to walk in though. In seventeen in the 1780s, I think 1786. I might be full of shit. I think you might have to check that. But the late 1700s. You know. <clears throat> the truly youngest rock in California occurs on Mount Lassen, uh, about 100 miles to the south, and that erupted in, I think, roughly 1917. But, uh, you know, I don't know if we're going to make it all the way up there before the sun sets, so it might be a good idea to head back. The climate has dropped precipitously, the temperature rather, it's about 38 degrees. And my hands are uh, starting to freeze as I hold this goddamn camera. So, you know, I think we might reach a limit here. Maybe we'll come back tomorrow and try again. You know, and maybe at the, getting us started at 11 a.m. instead of 3 p.m. But uh, regardless, it's pretty nice. There's my truck way down there. You can see that down there. Oh, yeah. Regardless, it's a lovely evening to be up here on Mount Shasta, you know? Hopefully we'll make it down a lot faster than we made it up. This is usually the case. This is pretty nice. Here's a white bark pine, Pinus albicollis, and it's got what must look like a, I mean, it's a massive fucking tree, probably, I don't know, eight feet, 10 feet wide. But of course, it doesn't get any taller than that because it just gets so harshly blasted by the wind here in the winter. So I didn't realize this was, I thought that was rock upon getting close to it. Let's see what it actually, oh yeah, a massive white bark. There you go. And it, that's called being krumholzed. You know, you ever been krumholzed before? Looks like a small tree. That, that tree is probably 600 years old, I'd assume. I mean, you can see how large the trunk is on it. It's a big guy. Oh, am I moving too slow for you, huh? There's some nice uh, Castilea, Indian paintbrush, or a and some nice uh, Penstemon Davidsonii, which doesn't look like a doesn't look like a Penstemon at all, but it is, believe it or not. Little purple flowers when they're in bloom. Oh, here's some that have just gone to fruit, just gone to seed. There you go. Look at that. Penstemon Davidsonii. Here's a nice uh, Pinus albicollis that they blew over. You can see, hey, get up there and look at it, that wood. This is this was probably a thousand year old tree. You know, you wouldn't, you couldn't tell it. It's not that tall, but uh, the wood is extremely thick. Feels like a rock. Very dense wood. The rings are probably only a millimeter apart, so that's, uh, you could tell. A millimeter is one of those little hash marks. Meaning that uh, it doesn't grow very fast. It grows pretty slow, and that's why it's a very thick, hard wood. And who knows how, how long ago this fell over, but it's, you know, obviously not rotting. It takes a long time to rot. Plus, it's too cold for it to rot most of the year here, so. So there you go. Some of those white bark pines up there where we were. I'm sure are easily upwards of a thousand, two thousand years old. Very slow growing season, very long lived pine up here. And furthermore, the, it's so cold half the year that many of the fungi and uh, insect pests that would might otherwise cause its demise at lower elevations uh, can't exist. So it's able to, to live a very long, uh, healthy life and you know die at the age of uh, 1100 maybe. Here comes the, uh, the wall of water vapor. It's cooled off enough the fog is moving in, so that might complicate getting down a little bit. Plus, this pumice sand has been extremely hard to walk through. You could see your feet just sink into it. It doesn't feel too nice. It's kind of a pain in the ass. I think this might be it. 
Should have gotten an earlier start. But, yeah, whatever, fuck it anyway. Still been nice coming up, you know. Just like that, uh, like I said, like that, that the inspirational quote on the high school guidance counselor's uh, office door, you know. The journey is not the destination. You know, and then, and then that makes me think of the high school guidance counselor I had that told me I'd go to jail one day. Which, you know, she was right. I did. Don't have any convictions, but, I, you know, I did have a overnight stay in the hotel over there. Anyway, beautiful night. Beautiful evening on Shasta. Come back for the sprint tomorrow, maybe. Oh, the sun feels good. All right, what else do I got for you tonight? Uh, have a lovely evening. Go fuck yourself and good night.